Uh, Deputy Speaker, it's probably fair to say that the contributions from those opposite on this debate have been, as always, disappointing. They cannot help themselves. Here we go. Order. The member for Lingiari will withdraw. I thank the member for Lingiari. So, and while the member for Lingiari is, uh, you know, insulting people personally when he doesn't disagree, when he doesn't agree with their ideas, when they won't bow to his thuggery, let me explain to him why the contribution from his side has been so disappointing. Because apparently, to listen to their speeches, they're all in favour of this um, piece of legislation. In fact, they tell us that their only complaint is that we didn't do it sooner, ignoring the fact that, of course, when they were in government, the greatest moral challenge of our times got swept under the carpet because it became too difficult for them. So instead of congratulating the government um, yesterday for doing something that they could never achieve when they were in power, they come here and they whinge and they whine and they complain that we just didn't act soon enough. So now, so now we're acting. But of course, once again, in this, in this most extraordinary of situations, they find themselves moving yet another piece of meaningless second, um, second speech amendment. And you'd have to ask yourself, why does the Labor Party continue to move the second reading, um, second reading speech amendments? Could it have anything to do? With this mysterious website called theyvoteforus.com.au. Let order, me guess, order, the state of the hat. Order. I call the honourable member for Lawler. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I'd like to draw your attention to the state of the house. Wow. Quorum present, ring the bells. Amazing. Quorum present, I call the honourable member for McKellar. So the Labor Party keeps calling quorums because they don't want to talk about they vote for us. And the reason they don't want to talk about these left-wing front groups is because it exposes their hypocrisy over and over again on these debates and so many other debates. They move these second reading speech amendments because they have got backed by their big tech billionaires, litigation lawyers and industry super. You may note one group missing in all of that organised labour, because they're no longer the party of organised labour. They're no longer the party of the working men and women of this country, because most of them haven't met one in their entire lives. Too stuck in the boardrooms of the Australian Super and Collins Street, where they get to look over, look over all that they've taken over. And that's why they don't care. They don't care if electricity prices go through the roof. They can come in here and they can quote to us as often as they want Boris Johnson and what Boris Johnson thinks of offshore. Um, offshore energy. But what they won't stand up and say is how about all those pensioners this winter in the United Kingdom who will not be able to afford heating because of the sorts of policies the that they would happily inflict on the Australian people from this place. But don't worry, Deputy Speaker, they vote for us, the big tech billionaires who've got their hands in their pockets for them, who are fronting up all these left-wing front groups for them to make it appear. Talk about astroturfing. Astroturfing, thy name is the Labor Party and the crossbench support that they rely on. The absurdity of their position over and over again. So even on a bill that they claim they support, they still have to move second reading speech amendments. They still have to quote Boris Johnson, who this year, who this year, the pensioners of the United Kingdom will find themselves either not heating themselves, not not being able to feed themselves because gas prices, because his over reliance, the UK's over reliance on offshore wind, under reliance on nuclear energy and Order. on gas. And they Order. don't want to talk, talk about, about that. that. They want us to go headlong into magic bean solutions for the, um, for, for the climate and for the energy market because that's what their backers. That's what their funders, that's what their donors want them to be, want them to do. And the working men and women of this country that you used to represent, that you used to stand up for, can go to hell as far as you guys are concerned. And people. Sorry, I don't mean to be gender specific about that. So, Deputy Speaker, what this shows is that we on this side 
are relying on technology. What we are doing on this side is actually creating the environment and the frameworks that allow other Australians, innovative Australians, to go out there and build the future, to go out there and build the electricity grid of the future. If this piece of legislation is not about banning, is not about mandating, is not about telling people what they can buy and how they can live. This is about creating an environment that enables investors to make decisions um, that will allow Australians to live in a net zero world sooner rather than later. It does this by encouraging them to do that. It does it by enabling them to do it. It does it by creating a positive vision about what this nation can be. But most of all, it does it by getting government out of the way of people who have the solutions to this problem. I mean, we keep hearing that renewable energy is the cheapest form of energy anywhere in the world. Well, if government is not in the way, then investors will start providing that energy. And you only have to look at the New South Wales government and their renewable energy zones to see the billions of dollars that is just waiting on the sidelines to invest in this sort of technology. Yes, we don't have all the solutions yet. Anyone who says they do is talking through their hat. But what we do know through the IPCC report, and those opposite should read past the executive summary. They should read chapters 2, 3 and 8 that talk about the importance of nuclear energy, that talk about the importance of firming and dispatchable power, that talk about the importance of carbon capture and storage to um, humanity getting to a net zero world. And yes, it also talks about the importance of renewable energy and it talks about the importance of offshore energy. And those on this side, like the member for Higgins, like the member for North Sydney, like the member for Wentworth, have pointed to all those things that sit before us right now. It only takes our capacity to reach out and grasp them. And that's what this bill does. This bill is a package of three bills. It's, it includes the offshore electricity infrastructure bill, the offshore ele electricity infrastructure regulatory levies. And it also includes um, uh, the, um, the bill for the regulatory levies in 2021, all of which were introduced to the House on the 2nd of September. These bills will establish that regulatory framework that will allow that in, um, investment, that will allow those things to occur, um, that will allow that positive vision to come to life. The offshore electricity infrastructure bill, the main bill, establishes that framework to enable the development of offshore electricity infrastructure. The proposed framework covers all phases of development, from construction through to decommissioning of generation and transmission projects. Projects that could be enabled by this legislation include the Marianas Link project over the long term and support Tasmania's battery of the nation vision that would see dispatchable power um, coming into the grids of Victoria, South Australia, New South Wales and Queensland that will allow more renewable energy to be used as part of our grid because that dispatchable power will be sitting there. The Star of the South, which um, many members have mentioned, which will allow 2.2 gigawatts of energy to come into the grid in Victoria that could, at different times of the day, represent 20 per cent of their electricity needs. We also have Sun Cable, which is backed, of course, by Twiggy Forrest and Mike Cannon-Brooks, and they are proposing to send electrons from the Northern Territory to um, Singapore. This is something that has had the backing of the Northern Territory government and, of course, the federal government and, of course, those private sector investors. And they are taking on the risk of innovating for that project. I think if the government was directly involved in that, two things would probably happen. It would be over budget and it would never quite work the way we wanted to. Because of this innovation, because of this private sector involvement, we are seeing um, where Australia is or will be um, sometime in the near future, um, exporting renewable energy to Singapore. Um, this will, I am told, this, this framework will see 10 projects that are already at proof of concept come into the marketplace and investment can, can commence. And why wouldn't it? Australia represents some of the best, um, uh, has some of the best uh, areas for offshore um, wind and also onshore wind. Um, that is what uh, uh, Geospace 
Australia says. It, globally speaking, um, we have some of the largest areas of territorial waters that we are responsible for. Innovations in floating um, offshore wind uh, is, allowing, um, is allowing the deployment of those stations further and further out to sea, all within the bodies of, a, of water that Australia has control over. That will represent massive opportunities for us to um, electrify our grid. Now, as Rewiring Australia has pointed out, the clearest path, not just for Australia but for the entire world, as Bill Gates um, uh, uh, argued quite succinctly in his book, that the best and clearest path towards net zero globally is to electrify everything we can. To do that, we will need to produce in Australia somewhere between five to six times as much electricity as we currently do, globally eight times what we do. The task in doing that should not be underestimated by anyone in this chamber or anyone in the media who sort of thinks that, uh, well, now we've declared it, we can all go home. No, this will be an incredibly difficult task for us to fulfil. Um, it is important to also note that, uh, this, um, is not that this, these bills are not just about offshore wind. They will also enable undersea cabling, which is also incredibly important for enabling us to get um, power, for in, in the most obvious case being from Tasmania to the mainland. If we can achieve these things, if we can make this work, then Australia can indeed not only um, set up a future where we have very cheap energy, um, very clean energy, but we can also start to attract to our nation those manufacturing jobs that we lost under the carbon tax, as people realise that this is the best place to make um, green steel, clean aluminium, because the major cost of that is energy, and that energy um, th that will be produced in Australia will be produced in such abundance that there will only be one logical place in the world to produce those um, materials and those goods, and that is here. So I call on the Labor Party to stop playing games for the benefit of their big tech billionaires Order. and to get <coughs> with the program. Order. The, qu the question is that the amendment be disagreed to, and I call the honourable member for Lilly. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. In January 2020, the Morrison government promised Australians that our offshore renewable industry would be open for business by mid-2021. Yet, here we are, with two and a half months left until the end of the year, debating the bill. This bill will establish regulatory framework to allow for the construction, installation, commissioning, operation, maintenance and decommissioning of offshore electricity infrastructure in the Commonwealth areas. Labor has been campaigning for a legislative framework to unlock the benefits of offshore renewables for some time. There is growing commercial interest in an Australian offshore electricity sector, with a dozen offshore wind prospects currently in the early planning stages around the country. These offshore renewable energy projects tick all of the boxes when you think of bang for buck economic investment. Offshore renewable energy has the potential to create a reliable and affordable electricity network that guarantees Australia's future energy security. It will see billions of dollars invested in Australia, creating tens of thousands of jobs while delivering social and economic benefits in our regional communities. It will maximise import and export trade opportunities which leverage our renewable energy resources. Offshore renewable energy also has the potential to expand our local manufacturing capacity and expand scalable supply chain benefits for small and medium enterprise in Australia.